Hey team, I'm back after a brief hiatus and I'm going to be doing a Q&A today to mark the end of my first year of medical school. If you're new to the channel, then welcome. My name is Danny Kalani and I'm just starting the second year of medical school. A few weeks back, I reached out to my followers on TikTok as well as some students from Western University, which is where I did my undergrad. And I asked them for any questions that they have about the medical school admissions process, about myself as a content creator, or more broadly, just what medical school is like. If you don't follow me on TikTok already, make sure to check it out. That's where I put a lot of my casual yet valuable content. Let's get into it. So Ali is asking what the prerequisites are to get into medical school and how GPA tends to be calculated. Generally, your best resource for this is going to be the universities and medical schools where you're looking to apply as they're going to have the most up-to-date information on this. And the prerequisites can change from year to year, so you'll definitely want to check what the prerequisites are the year that you're applying. Now, a majority of Canadian schools don't actually have prerequisites, so that can be a useful thing that allows you to pursue whichever degree you're most passionate about but it also means that some schools do have prerequisites, which could influence the way that you decide to select your major um, in that you might wanna to choose to do a science degree as that might open up more options for you. Some notable medical schools that do have prerequisite course requirements would be the University of British Columbia, the University of Ottawa, as well as the medical schools in Quebec. The way that GPA is calculated also is going to differ by school and can differ from year to year. Your GPA is also interpreted slightly differently in the Ontario medical school system based on which university you decide to attend and the GPA system that they run at that university. The Ontario universities use this undergraduate GPA conversion table, which I'll just link in the description. It's a little bit complicated, but once you figure it out, it makes a lot of sense. Now that you have an idea of how schools will calculate GPA by year, there's also some additional rules that some medical schools apply to your GPA that are generally going to be in your favor. They're going to inflate your GPA a bit. A good example of that is the University of Toronto, where if you've completed at least three years of your undergraduate studies before applying, they will remove two full course equivalents, um, the lowest two full course equivalents specifically, to improve your GPA slightly. To be eligible for that, I mentioned one of the things that you would need to do, which is have three years worth of your undergraduate degree done. And the other thing is that you would have needed to complete at least five courses each fall and winter semester to be eligible. There's a lot of variation in how schools will apply policies like this. So it's important that you take a look at them. Most of them are going to improve your GPA. So don't worry about it too much. From Running Ahmed, we've got a question about the application timeline for Canadian medical schools. So most applications will open up around July for Canadian medical schools and they'll close by October. There's an important difference between Canadian and American medical schools and that's that Canadian schools don't do what's called rolling admissions, meaning that there's no advantage to submitting your application earlier in Canada. The goal for Canadian medical schools is to have your application in by the deadline. By then, you'll also need to have all of your documents into the medical school, and that's going to include your MCAT score, your transcript, your references, as well as the written application itself. Some schools also have you do a test called CASPER, which is an online test that essentially requires you to respond to ethical situations and type up responses to them. I didn't take this test myself, but from my understanding, schools will give you the specific dates where you can take the test. And those will usually be between August and November of the year that you're applying. Between October and the new year, medical schools will typically go quiet. A few will give interview invites a little bit earlier, but most won't give them until the new year at the earliest. For the majority of schools, you'll expect to hear back for interview invites between January and early March. Most interviews will happen between February and April, although some may go into May. Then there's a radio silence from medical schools until May, where you'll hear back regarding whether you were accepted, rejected, or waitlisted. If you're accepted, you'll start between July and September of the year after you applied. I personally started in July as my school is a three-year program. The process of applying is long and requires a lot of waiting. 
So make sure that you're keeping yourself busy with other things that will take your mind off of the application process. Maxine is asking, what are some common medical school interview questions and how do we approach answering them? To answer the second part of your question first, I'll refer to a video that I made on how to approach medical school interview questions. And I give you a solid strategy for doing that. That worked well for me. Obviously, it's not gonna work well for everyone and you can adapt different strategies to meet your personal interviewing style. In terms of what common medical school interview questions are, there's essentially an infinite number of them. And that's exactly why I recommend having an approach to answering your questions rather than having some uh, predetermined answers prepared already. That actually also means having some experiences prepared as well that you can use and slot in to answer particular questions that you feel those experiences are particularly relevant to. So if they ever ask you about a time when X, Y, or Z happened to you, you'll be ready to give them an answer without having to reflect on it on the spot. A common question for panel and traditional type interviews is going to be to either tell me about yourself or tell me about why you're wanting to study medicine. These types of questions aren't frequently asked at MMI interviews, but it is helpful to have an answer to these and making sure that your answer doesn't come off as prepared and robotic is quite important, but rather that you're giving a genuine perspective of your own life. Essentially, you're not going to be able to prepare for every single type of question that you will get at an interview. So the important thing is that you do as much practice as possible and that you try to come in with some strategies that you can apply on the day of that'll make you feel more comfortable answering the questions and you'll be able to be yourself. Charlene is asking, what are some things that set myself apart from other applicants in terms of extracurricular activities? If you wanna hear a long drawn out answer on my entire path to medical school, then definitely check out a video, which I'll link here. But otherwise, I wanna give you some solid advice that you can apply to your own extracurricular activities and application to medical school. I approached my extracurricular activities with three main principles. Number one is that it should be something that I enjoy. If it's not something I enjoy, then it's going to be difficult for me to continue doing it for a lengthy period of time. It's also going to be difficult to write about it and show that I'm passionate about it. Number two is that it should be something that contributes to the greater good of the community or society. This doesn't have to be the traditional volunteering in a hospital, raising money for cancer research, or going abroad to do a medical trip. It doesn't have to be anything like that. For example, this could be being an events coordinator for a school group and putting on events that bring people together and make them feel like a positive part of a school community. It could also be more indirect, like research that has the potential to have positive impacts on society. And thirdly, you want this activity to contribute to you developing some sort of soft skill like teamwork or empathy that you could use in the medical field. With that in mind, most of the things that I did my extracurriculars in were around things that I was passionate about, such as using programming to contribute to the improvement of health by coding some technology that could do that at a hackathon. And I learned some programming here and there by picking up some roles in labs as well as working on some side projects. After developing those skills, I took my passion to hackathons, specifically one at the Johns Hopkins Medical School. And my team ended up using the same technology that supports Bitcoin to create a platform that allows patients to have more control over their patient records and be able to take their patient records with them to whichever healthcare provider they choose in a safe and secure way. I also did some of the typical pre-med activities like volunteering at a hospital, but what's important with those is that you apply your unique perspective for doing them. I should also add that what activities you actually do and include on your application is important, but oftentimes, what can take your application to the next level is how you actually write about those activities. I'll be doing a future video with tips on writing your application, so make sure you're subscribed and you've turned on notifications for that. The next question is, which medical school do I attend? I go to the University of Calgary's medical school, and it's a great school if you wanna be close to the Rockies while also having a three-year program 
which gives you a great opportunity to get involved in clinical experiences early on. I really like the medical school here. We have an amazing collaborative culture that's just so positive to be around. And I'm looking forward to spending more time with my classmates in person when COVID restrictions allow for that. Bill asks, what is my go-to study playlist? I really like this reading chill out playlist on Spotify. It's really not very intrusive and there's no lyrics in it, so it's not gonna distract you while you're studying. I don't always listen to music when I study, but when I do, it's usually on days when I'm feeling a little less motivated and I need a little boost or just to help me avoid getting distracted. Junaid asks, what do I do with my spare time and what are my hobbies? With medical school, the time that I have to do my hobbies is a lot less plentiful, but I definitely take advantage of it. The YouTube channel is one hobby of mine. I don't make any money from it, so I definitely consider it a hobby, but I really love editing videos, coming up with ideas to film and just speaking to the camera. In the new year, in 2021, I've been getting into cycling as well. I've got a bike set up on a stationary uh, platform and I'm able to run Zwift on it, which is like this video game like biking program. I'll put a little bit of a B-roll here, some video for you to show what Zwift looks like, but it's a lot of fun and it makes exercise feel a lot more like a video game, which I'm definitely not against. It's also helped me to stay more fit and active during the pandemic, which has definitely taken a toll on my ability to stay active by going to the gym. I've also recently been getting into photography more as just a side hobby. I haven't gotten too good at it yet, but feel free to check out my Instagram and see some of the latest pictures that I've taken. I'll definitely be sharing some more on there. Being in Alberta, it's a really great opportunity to get into photography. We have some of the most beautiful landscapes in the world, so I'm definitely going to be taking advantage of that. The next question is how am I planning to pay off my debt after I'm finished medical school? Paying off my student loans definitely feels a little bit far away for me right now. I do recognize that I will be paid a bit in residency. Nothing significant, but it's enough to keep me going and I'll be trying to pay off a little bit of my debt during residency if I can. But at my current stage, it's more about how do I minimize my debt? So I spent three years at the University of Western Ontario where I was paying full-time tuition there. And I was also paying for my living expenses while living in London, Ontario. Then I'll also have the cost of medical school for three years in Calgary. Luckily, I have family here, so I'm able to live with them and significantly reduce the expenses that I have. I also will probably be paying less tuition than most medical students in Canada in the sense that the University of Calgary has one of the lower tuitions as far as medical schools go. Our tuition is around $16,000 per year and a lot of other medical schools tend to be 20 grand or higher than that. Plus, since we're a three-year program, I'll be paying around 50,000 or so dollars total in tuition for all three years, which when you compare that to American medical schools, doesn't sound so bad. So the first part of my plan is to minimize the debt that I take, and that's going to involve not purchasing anything too fancy. No fancy apartment, no fancy cars, nothing crazy like that. I always try and remember that the money that you take on as debt isn't really yours and that when you take it, you're going to be paying back a good amount of interest on top of what you borrowed. So if you're buying a $30,000 car with a loan, that's going to end up costing you a significant amount more because of the interest. I'm also working on my ability to manage money right now. Specifically, I'm working on learning how to invest in the stock market. I've been doing it for around three years and I feel like I've learned quite a bit and I've gotten significantly better at it. Maybe that's something that I'll end up sharing with you all on this channel at some point. Let me know in the comments if that's something you're interested in hearing about. And I think it's important to develop those skills early because by the time that I actually have a salary that I'll be able to invest, I'll be quite familiar with how to go about doing that and find ways to turn my money into more money to keep myself financially afloat. If you've made it to the end, thank you for watching and a big thanks to everyone who sent in questions. I appreciate the diversity of questions that I ended up getting. I'm also thinking of doing another Q&A video in the future, so definitely leave your questions in the comments and I'll either just type back a reply or maybe you'll end up getting included in the next Q&A video. Maybe I'll do that around a thousand subscribers, but we'll have to see. That's all for now and thank you for watching.